Section 5 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. Section 5 from 1607 to 1635, Part 1. Though the monopoly had yet to be rescinded, Poutincourt set himself to interesting merchants in the fur trade of Acadia, and the French king confirmed to him the grant of Port Royal. Yet it was 1610 before Baron Poutincourt had gathered supplies to re-establish the colony, and an ominous cloud rose on the horizon, threatening his supremacy in the New World. Nearly all the merchants supporting him were either Huguenots or moderate Catholics. The Jesuits were all-powerful at court and were pressing for a part in his scheme. The Jesuit, Father Bard, was waiting at Bordeaux to join the ship. Poitincourt evaded issues with such powerful opponents. He took on board Father La Flèche, a moderate, and gave the Jesuit the slip by sailing from Dieppe in February. To this quarrel there are two sides, as to all quarrels. The colony must now be supported by the fur trade, and fur traders, world over, easily add to their profits by deeds which will not bear the censure of missionaries. On the other hand, to Porincourt, the Jesuits mean divided authority, and the most lawless scoundrel that ever perpetrated crimes in the fur trade could win over the favor of the priests by a hypocritical semblance, trition at the confessional. Contrition never yet undid a crime and civil courts can take no cognizance of repentance. When the ships sailed in to Port Royal, the little fort was found precisely as it had been left. Not even the furniture had been disturbed, and old member to the Indian chief, welcomed the white men back with taciturn joy. Pierre La Flush assembles the savages, tells them the story of the Christian faith, then to the beat of a drum and chant te diem receives one afternoon twenty naked converts into the folds of the church member two is baptized henry after the king and all his frowsy squaws renamed after ladies of the most dissolute court in christendom young bunyan court is to convey the ship back to france he finds that the Queen Dowager has taken the Jesuits under her special protection, money enough to buy out the interests of the Huguenot merchants, for the Jesuits has been advanced. Fathers Baird and Massey embark on the grace of God with young Viencourt in January 1611 for Port Royal. Almost at once the divided authority results in trouble. Coasting the Bay of Fundy, Biancourt discovers that Pontgrave's son has roused the hostility of the Indians by some shameless act. Young Biancourt is for hanging the miscreant to the yardum, but the sinner gains the ear of the saints by woeful tale of penitence, and Father Baird sides with young Pontgrave. Instead of the gaiety that reigned at Port Royal and Les Escarbots day, now is sullen mistrust. The Jesuits threaten young Biancourt with excommunication. Biancourt retaliates by threatening them with expulsion. For three months, no religious services are held. The boat of 1612 brings out another Jesuit, Gilbert the Thet, and Jonas, which comes in 1613 with 50 more men, La Sassoui, commander, Fleury, captain, has been entirely outfitted by friends of the Jesuits. By this time, Baron de Poitincourt in France was involved in debt beyond hope, but his right to Port Royal was unshaken, 
and the Jesuits decided to steer south to seek a new site for their colony. Zigzagging along the coast of Maine, Captain Fleury cast anchor off Mount Desert at Frenchman's Bay. A cross was erected, mass celebrated, and four white tents pitched to house the people. But the clash between civil and religious authority broke out again. The sailors would not obey the priests. Fleury feared mutiny. Sassanet, the commander, lost his head, and disorder was ripening to disaster when there appeared over the sea the peak of a sail, a sail topped by a little red ensign, the flag of the English, who claimed all this coast. And the sail was succeeded by decks with sixty mariners and hulls through which ports bristled fourteen cannon. The newcomer was Samuel Argall of Virginia, whom the Indians had told of the French, now bearing down full sail, cannon leveled, to expel these aliens from the domain of England's king. Drums were beating, trumpets were blowing, fifes shrieking. There was no mistaking the purpose of the English ship. Saucier, the French commander, dashed for hiding in the woods. Captain Fleury screamed for blood from an English cannonade that swept the French decks bare and set all sails in flame. In the twinkling of an eye, Argall had captured men and craft. Fifteen of the French prisoners he set adrift in open boat on the chance of their joining the French fishing fleet off Cape Breton. They were ultimately carried to St. Malo. The rest of the prisoners, including Father Baird, he took back to Virginia, where the commission held from the French king assured them honorable treatment in time of peace. But Argall was promptly sent north again with his prisoners and three frigates to lay waste every vestige of French settlement from Maine to St. John Mount Desert, the ruins of St. Croix, the fortress below beloved by Poitincourt at Point Royal, the ripening wheat of Annapolis Basin, all fed the flames of Argyll's zeal, and young Vincourt's wood runners, watching from the forests, the destruction of all their hopes, the ruin of all their plans, ardently begged their young commander to parley with Argyll that they might obtain the Jesuit Baird and hang him to the highest tree. To his coming they attributed all the woes. It was as easy for them to believe that the Jesuit had piloted the English destroyer to Port Royal as it had been ten years before for the Catholics to accuse the Huguenots of murdering the lost priest Aubrey and there was probably as much truth in one charge as the other. So fell Port Royal, but out round the ruins of Port Royal, where the little river runs down to the sea past Goat Island, young Biancourt and his followers took to the woods, the first of that race of bush lopers, half savages, half noblemen, to render France such glorious service in the New World. When de Mont's lost monopoly of furs in Acadia, Champlain, the court geographer, had gone home from Port Royal to France. De Mont's now succeeds in obtaining a fresh monopoly for one year on the St. Lawrence, and sends out two ships in 1608 under his old friends, Pontgrave, who is to attend to the bartering, Champlain, who is to explore. With them come some of the colonists from Port Royal, among others Louis Hebert, the chemist, first colonist to become farmer at Quebec, and Abraham Martin, whose name was given to the famous plains where Wolfe and Montcalm later fought. Pontgrave arrived at the rendezvous of Tadoussac early in June. Here he found Basque fishermen engaged in the peltry traffic with Indians from Labrador. When Pontgrave read his commission interdicting all ships but those of de Monts from trade, the Basques poured a fusillade of musketry across his decks, killing one man, wounding two, 
then boarded his vessel and trundled his cannon ashore so much for royal commissions and monopoly at this stage came champlain on the second boat two vessels were overstrong for the basques they quickly came to terms and decamped champlain steered his tiny craft on up the silver flood of the st lawrence to that cape diamond where cartier's men had gathered worthless stones between the high cliff and the river front not far from the marketplace off quebec city today workmen began clearing the woods for the site of the french habitation the little fort was palisaded of course with moat outside and cannon commanding the river the walls were loopholed for musketry and inside ran a gallery to serve as lookout and defense houses barracks garden and freshwater supply completed the fort one day as champlain worked in his garden a colonist begged to speak with him champlain stepped into the woods the man then blurted out how a conspiracy was on foot instigated by the basques to assassinate champlain seize the fort and stab any man who dared to resist one of Pontgray's small boats lay at anchor. Champlain sent for the pilot, told him the story of the plot, gave him two bottles of wine, and bade him invite the ringlingers on board that night to drink. The ruse worked. The ringlingers were handcuffed, and other colonists awakened in the fort and told that the plot had been crushed. The body of Duval, the chief plotter, in pay of the Basques, swung as warning from a gibbet, and his head was exposed on a pike to the birds of the air. Though Pontgrave left a garrison of twenty-eight when he sailed for France, less than a dozen men had survived the plague of scurvy when the ships came back to Champlain in 1609. Champlain's part had been to explore. Now that his fort was built, he planned to do this by allying himself with the Indians, who came down to trade at Quebec. There were the Hurons and the Montagnais, the former from Ottawa, the latter from Labrador. Both waged ceaseless war on the Iroquois south of the St. Lawrence. After bartering their furs for weapons from the traders, the allied tribes would set out on the warpath against the Iroquois. In June, Champlain and eleven white men accompanied the roving warriors. The way led from the St. Lawrence south up to the river Richelieu. Champlain's boat was a ponderous craft, and when the shiver of the sparkling rapids came with a roar through the dank forest, the heavy boat had to be sent back to Quebec. Adopting the light birch canoe of the Indian, Champlain went on, accompanied by only two white men. Of Indians, there were twenty-four canoes with sixty warriors. For the first part of the voyage, night was made hideous by the grotesque war dances of the braves lashing themselves to furry by scalp raids in pantomime, or by the medicine man holding solemn converse with the demons of earth. The tent poles of the medicine lodge rocked as if by wind, while Eldritch howls predicted victory. Then the long line of silent canoes had spread out on that upland lake named after Champlain. The heavily forested Andriondecks, breaking the skyline on one side, the green mountains rolling away on the other. Caution now marked all advance. The Indians paddled only at night, withdrawing to the wooded shore through the morning mist to hide in the undergrowth for the day. This was the land of the Iroquois. On July 29th, as the invaders were stealing silently along the west shore near Crown Point at night about 10 o'clock, there were seen by the starlight coming over the water with that particular galloping motion of paddles dipping together the Iroquois war canoes. Each side recognized the other, and the woods rang with shouts. 
but gathering clouds and the mist rising from the river screened the foes from mutual attack although the night echoed to shout and counter shout and challenge and abuse through the half light champlain could see that the iroquois were working like beavers erecting a barricade of logs the assailants kept to their canoes under cover of bullhide shields till daylight when champlain buckled on his armor breastplate helmet thigh pieces and landing advanced they were no less than two hundred iroquois outnumbering the hurons three times over they uttered a jubilant whoop and came on at a rush champlain and his two white men took aim the foremost chiefs dropped in their tracks terrified by the sticks that thundered and spat fire the iroquois fell back in a maze halted then fled the victory was complete but it left as a legacy to the undying enmity of the iroquois when champlain came out from france in sixteen ten he would have repeated the raid but a fight with invading iroquois at the mouth of the richelieu delayed him and the expiration of de mont's monopoly took him back to france in 1611, trade was free to all comers. Fur traders flocked to the St. Lawrence like birds of a passage. The only way to secure furs for De Mont was to go higher up the river beyond Quebec, and ascending to Montreal, Champlain built a factory called Place Royale with a wall of bricks to resist the ice jam. This was the third French fort Champlain helped to found in Canada. Presently, on his tracks to Montreal, came a flock of free traders. When the Hurons came shooting down the foamy rapids, here a pole shoved to avoid splitting canoes on a rock in mid-rush, there a dexterous whirl from the trough of a backwash, the fur traders fire off their guns in welcome. The Hurons are suspicious. What means it, these white men, coming in such numbers, firing off their sticks that thunder? At midnight, they come stealthily to Champagne's lodge to complain. Peltries and canoes, the Indians transfer themselves above the rapids and later conduct Champagne down those same white whirlpools to the uneasy amaze of the explorer. It is clear to Champagne he must obtain royal patronage to stem the boldness of these free traders. In France, he obtains the favor of the Bourbons, and he obtains it more generously because the world of Paris has gone agog about a fabulous tale that sets the court by the ears. From the first, Champagne has encouraged young Frenchmen to winter with the Indian hunters and learn the languages. Brule is with them now. Nicholas Vigneau has just come back from the Ottawa with a fairy story of a marvelous voyage he has made with the Indians through the forest to the Sea of the North, the sea where Henry Hudson, the Englishman, had perished. As the romance gains the ear of the public, the young man waxes eloquent in detail and tells of the number of Englishmen living there. Champlain is ordered to follow this exploration up. May 1613, he is back at Montreal, opposite that island named St. Helen, after the frail girl who became his wife, preparing to ascend the Ottawa with four white men among them Vinot. What Vinot's sensations were, one may guess. The vain youth had not meant his love for notoriety to carry him so far, and he must have known that every foot of the way led him nearer detection. But the liar is always a gambler with chance. Mishap, bad weather, Indian war, might drive Champagne back. Vinot assumed bold face. The path followed was that river trail up the Ottawa, which was to become the highway of Empire's westward march 
for two and a half centuries. Mont Royal is left to the rear as the voyagers traverse the Indian trail through the forests along the rapids to that launching place named after the patron saint of a French voyageur, St. Anne's. The river widens into the silver expanse of two mountains lake, rimmed to the skyline by the vernal hills, with a silence and solitude all over, as when sunlight first fell on the face of man. Here the eagle utters a lonely scream from the top of some blasted pine. There is a convoy of ducks catching sight of the coming canoes, dive to bottom, only to reappear a gunshot away. When the voyagers land for their nooning or camp at nightfall, or pause to gum the spits in their birch canoes, the forest in the full flush of spring, verdure is a fairy woods. Against the elms and the maples, leafing out in airy tracery that reveals the branches, bronze among the budding green, stand the silvery birches and the somber hemlock and the resinous pines. Upbursting from the mold below is another miniature forest, a forest of ferns putting out the hairy fronds that in another month will be above the height of a man. Overhead, like a flame of fire, flashes the scarlet tanger with his querulous call, or the oriole flirts from branch to branch, fluting his springtime notes, or the yellow warbler balances on topmost spray to sing his crisp love song on the long journey north to nest on Hudson Bay. And over all and in all, intangible as light, intoxicating as wine, is the tang of the clear, unsullied crystal air, setting the blood coursing with new life. Little wonder that Brule and Vinot and other young men who Champlain sent to the woods to learn wood lore became so enamored of the life that they never returned to civilization. Presently, the sibilant rush of waters forewarns rapids. Indians and voyagers debark, invert canoes on their shoulders, packs on back with straps across foreheads, and amble away over the portages at the voyagers' dog trot, which is half walk, half run. So the rapids of Carolyn and Long Salt are ascended. Nighttime is passed on some sandy shore on a bed under the stars or under the canoes turned upside down. Tents are erected only for the commander, Champlain, and at day dawn, when the tips of the trees are touched with light and the morning mist is smoking up from the river shot with gold, canoes are again on the water and paddle blades tossing the winds behind. End of section 5 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number six of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1607 to 1635, Part 2. The Laurentian hills now roll from the river in purpling folds like fields of heather. The Gatineau is passed, winding in on the right through dense forests. On the left, flowing through the rolling sand hills and joining the main river just where the waters fall over a precipice in a cataract of spray is the Rideau River with its famous falls resembling the white folds of a wind-blown curtain. Then the voyagers have swept round that wooded cliff known as Parliament Hill, jutting out in the river, and there breaks on view a wall of water hurling down in shimmering floods at the Chaudier Falls. The high cliff to the left 
and concurrent from the falls swirl the canoes over to the right side to the sandy flats where the lumber piles to-day defile the river here boats are once more hauled up for portage a long portage nine miles all the way to the modern town of almer where the river becomes as wide as a lake lake du chen of the oak forests here camp for the night was made and leaks in the canoes mended with resin round fires gleaming red as an angry eye across the darkening waters while the prowling wildcats and lynx which later gave such good hunting in these forests that the adjoining rapids became known as the chats sent their unearthly screams shivering through the darkness somewhere near lumet isle champlain came to an indian settlement of the ottawa tribe he camped to ask for guides to go on old chief to sell it holds solemn powwow passing the peace pipe round from hand to hand in silence before the warriors rise to answer champlain then with the pompous gravity of abraham dickering with the desert tribes they warn champlain it is unsafe to go farther beyond the ottawa is the nipsing where dwell the sorcerer indians a treacherous people beyond the nipsing is the great fresh water sea of the hurons they will grant champlain canoes but warn him against a trip later the interpreter comes with word they have changed their minds champlain must not go on it is too dangerous attack would involve war what demanded champlain rushing in the midst of the council tent to not go why my young man here pointing to Vinot, has gone to that country and found no danger what Vinot thought at that stage is not told the indians turn on him in fury nicholas did you say you had visited the Nipsings? Vinot hems and haws and stammers, yes. Liar, roars the chief. You slept here every night, and if you went to the Nipsings, you went in a dream. Then to Champlain, let him be tortured. Champlain took the fellow to his own tent. Vinot reiterated his story. Champlain took him back to the council. The Indians jeered his answers and tore the story he told to tatters, showing Champlain how utterly wrong Vinot's descriptions were. That night, on promise of forgiveness, Vinot fell on his knees and confessed the imposture to Champlain. When the fur canoes came down the Ottawa to trade at Montreal, Champlain accompanied them to the St. Lawrence and sailed for France his exploration had been an ignominious failure champlain was ever knight of the cross as well as explorer he longed with the zeal of a missionary to reclaim the indians from savagery and at last raised funds in france to pay the expense of bringing four or five recollects a branch of the franciscan friars to quebec in may of sixteen fifteen with the peaked hood thrown back the gray garb roped in at the waist the bare feet protected only by heavy sandals the recollects landed at quebec and with cannon booming white men all on bended knee held service before the amazed savages of the recollects it was agreed that joseph le caron should go west to the hurons of the sweet water sea accompanied by a dozen frenchmen the friar ascended the ottawa in july passed the Illumet island where vinot's lie had been confessed and proceeded westward to the land of the hurons nine days later champlain followed with two canoes ten indians and etienne brule his interpreter in order to hold the everlasting loyalty of the hurons and algonquins in canada champlain had pledged them that the french would join their twenty five hundred warriors in a great invasion of the iroquois to the south it was to be a war not of aggression but of defence 
for the five nations of the Iroquois in New York State had harried the Canadian tribes like wolves raiding a sheep pen. No Frenchman cultivating his farm patch on the St. Lawrence was safe from ambuscade, no hunter afield secure from a chance war party. Any tourist crossing Canada today can trace Champlain's voyage, where the rolling tide of the Ottawa forks at Mattawa there comes in on the west side through dense forests and cedar swamps a river amber-colored with the wood mold of centuries this is the mattawa up the mattawa champlain pushed his canoes westward up the shining flood of the yellow river as gold where the waters shallow above the pebble bottom then the gravel grated keels the shallows became weed-grown swamps that entangled the paddles and hid voyageur from voyageur in reeds the height of a man, and presently a portage over rocks, slippery as ice leads, to a stream flowing westward, opening on a low-lying clay-colored lake, the country of the Nipsings, with whom Champlain pauses to feast and hear tales of witchcraft and demon lore. They gave them the name of sorcerers. In a few sleeps, they tell him, he will reach the Sweetwater Sea. The news is welcome, for the voyagers are down to short rations, and launched eagerly westward on the stream draining Nipson Lake, French River. This is a tricky little stream in whose sands lie buried the bodies of countless French voyagers. It is more dangerous going with rapids than against them, for the hastening current is sometimes an undertow which sweeps the canoes into the rapids before the roar of the waterfall has given warning, and the country is barren of game. As they cross the portages, Champlain's men are glad to snatch at the raspberry and cranberry bushes for food and their night-time meal is dependent on chance fishing. Indian hunters are met, three hundred of them, the staring hares, so named from the upright posture of their headdress tipped by an eagle quill, and again Champlain is told is very near the inland sea. It comes as discoveries nearly always come, his finding of the great lakes, for though Joseph Le Caron, the missionary, had passed this way ten days ago, the zealous priest never paused to explore and map the region. You are paddling down the brown, foreshadowed waters, long lanes of water, like canal through walls of trees, silent as sentinels. Suddenly a change almost imperceptible comes. Instead of the earthy smell of the forest mold in your nostrils is the clear tang of sun-bathed, water-washed rocks, and the sky begins to swim, to lose itself at the horizon. There is no sudden bursting of a sea on your view. The river begins to coil in and out among islands. The amber waters have become sheeted silver. You wind from island to island, islands of pink granite, islands with no tree but one lone blasted pine, islands that are in themselves forests. There is no end to these islands. They are not in hundreds, they are in thousands. Then you see the spray breaking over the reefs, and there is a skyline. You are not on a river at all. You are on an inland sea. You have been on the lake for hours. One can guess how Champlain's men scrambled from island to island and fished for the rock bass above the deep pools, and ran along the waterline of wave-dashed reefs, wondering vaguely if the wind wash were the ocean tide of the western sea. But Champlain's Huron guides had not come to find a western sea. With the quick choppy stroke of the Indian paddler, they were conveying him down that eastern shore of Lake Huron, now known as Georgian Bay, from French River to Perry Sound, 
and Midland and Pentang. Where these little towns today stand on the hillsides was a howling wilderness of forest, with never a footprint but the zigzagging trail of the Indians back from Georgian Bay to what is now Lake Simcoe. Between these two shores lay the stamping grounds of the great Huron tribe. How numerous were they? Records differ, certainly at no time more numerous than 30,000 souls all told, including children. Though they yearly came to Montreal for trade and war, the Hurons were sedentary, living in the long houses of bark enclosed by triple palisades, such as Cartier had seen at Hochelaga almost a century before. Champlain followed his supple guides along the wind-fallen forest trail to the Huron villages. Here he found the missionary. One can guess how the souls of these two heroes burned as the deep solemn chant to the Te Deum for the first time rolled through the forests of Lake Huron. But now Champlain must to business, and his business is war. Brule and twelve Indians are sent like the carriers of a fiery cross in the highlands of Scotland to rally tribes of the Susquehanna to join the Hurons against the Iroquois. A wild war dance is held with the mystic rites of the lodges of the Hurons, and the braves set out with Champlain from St. Simcoe for Lake Ontario by way of Trent River. As they near the, what is now New York State, buckskin is flung aside, the naked bodies painted and greased, and the trail shunned for the pathless woods off the beaten track where the Indian glide like beasts of prey through the frost-tinted forest. The October ninth, they suddenly come on some anacondas fishing, and they begin torturing their captives by cutting off a girl's finger when Champlain commands them to desist. Presently the forest opens to a farm clearing where the Iroquois are harvesting their corn. Spite of all Champlain could do, the wild Hurons uttered their war cry and rushed the field, but the Iroquois turned on the rabble and drove them back to the woods. Champlain was furious. They should have waited for Brule to come with their allies, and the foolish attack had only served to forewarn the enemy. He frankly told the Hurons if they were going to fight under his command, they must fight as white men fight, and he set them to building a platform from which marksmen could shoot over the walls of the Iroquois town. But the admonitions fell on frenzied ears. No sooner was the command to advance given than the Hurons broke from cover like maniacs, easy marks for the javelin throwers inside the walls, and hurled themselves against the Iroquois palisades in blind fury, making more din with yelling than woe with shots. Boiling water poured from the galleries inside, drove the braves back from the walls, and poisoned barb of the Iroquois arrows pursued their flight. A score fell wounded, among them Champlain with an arrow in his kneecap. The flight became panic, fast and furious, with the wounded carried on wicker stretchers whose every jolt added agony to pain. As for Brule, he arrived with the alleys only to find that the Hurons had fled, and here was he, alone in a hostile land with Iroquois warriors rampant as molested wasps. In the swift retreat off the trail, Brule lost his way. He was without food or powder, and had to choose between starvation or surrender to the Iroquois. Throwing down his weapons, he gave himself up to what he knew would be a certain torture. He had winced or whined as they tore the nails from his fingers and the hair from his head. The Iroquois would probably have brained him on the spot for a poltroon, but the young man, bound to a stake, pointed 
to a gathering storm a sign of heaven's displeasure the high spirit pleased the iroquois they unbound him and took him with them in their wanderings for three years the hurons had promised to convey champlain back down the st lawrence to quebec but the defeat had caused loss of prestige the man with the stick that thundered was no more invulnerable to wounds than they they forgot their promises and invented excuses for not proceeding to quebec champlain wintered with the hunters somewhere north of lake ontario and came down the ottawa with fur canoes the next summer he was received at quebec as one risen from the dead while champlain had been exploring new france had not prospered as a colony royal patron after royal patron sold the monopoly to fresh hands and each new master appointed champlain vic viceroy the new fur trade merchants could pay forty per cent dividends but could do nothing to advance settlement less than one hundred people made up the population of new france and these were torn asunder by jealousies huguenot and catholic were opposed and when three jesuits came to quebec jesuits and recollects distrusted each other madame champlain joined her husband at quebec in sixteen twenty to stay for four years and that same year champlain built himself a new habitation the famous castle of st louis on the cliff above the first dwelling louis herbert the apothecary of port royal is now a farmer close to the castle of quebec and the wife of abraham martin has given birth to the first white child born in new france now came a revolutionary change cardinal richelieu was virtual ruler of france he quickly realized that the monopolists were sucking the lifeblood of the colony in furs and were giving nothing in return to the country in sixteen twenty seven under the great cardinal's patronage the company of one hundred associates was formed this company any of the seaport traders could buy shares indeed they were promised patent of nobility if they did buy shares exclusive monopoly of furs was given to the company from florida to labrador in return the associates were to send two ships yearly to canada before sixteen forty three they were to bring out four thousand colonists support them for three years and give them land in each settlement were to be supported three priests and to prevent discord huguenots were to be banished from new france to champlain it must have seemed as if the ambition of his life were to be realized just when the sky seemed to be clearest the bolt fell early in april sixteen twenty eight the associates had dispatched colonists and stores for quebec but war had broken out between france and england gervais kirk an english huguenot of dieppe france who had been put under the ban by cardinal richelieu had rallied the merchants of london to fit out privateers to wage war on new france the vessels were commanded by the three sons thomas louis and david and to the kirks rallied many huguenots banished from france quebec was hourly looking for the annual ships when one morning in july two men rushed breathless through the woods and up the steep rock to castle st louis with word that an english fleet of six frigates lay in hiding at tadousac ready to pounce on the french later came other messages indians fishermen traders confirming the terrible news then a basque fisherman arrives with a demand from kirk for the keys to the fort though there is no food inside the walls less than fifty pounds of ammunition in the storehouse and not enough men to man the guns champlain hopes against hope and sends the 
Basque fisherman back with suave regrets that he cannot comply with Monsieur Kirk's polite request. Quebec's one chance lay in the hope that the French vessels might slip past the English frigates by night. Days were on to weeks, weeks to months, and a thousand rumors filled the air, but no ships came. The people of Quebec were now reduced to diet of nuts and corn. Then came Indian runners with word that the French ships had been waylaid, boarded, scuttled, and sunk, loaded to the water line with booty the English privateers had gone home. For that winter Quebec lived on such food as the Indians brought in from the woods. For the summer of 1629, men, women, and children were grubbing for roots, fishing for food, ranging the rocks for berries. There are times when the only thing to do is do nothing, and it is probably the hardest task a brave man ever has. When the English fleet came back in July, Champlain had a ragmuffin, half-starved retinue of precisely sixteen men, yet he haggled for such terms that the English promised to convey the prisoners to France. On July 20th, for the first time in history, the red flag of England blew to the winds above the heights of Quebec, but New France was only a pawn to the gamesters of French and English diplomacy. Peace was proclaimed, and the for sake of receiving $200,000 as dowry due to his French wife, Charles of England restored to France the half-continent which the Kirks had captured. David Kirk, receiving the paltry honor of title as compensation for the loss, Champlain was back in Quebec by 1633, but his course had run. Between Christmas Eve and Christmas morning in 1635, the brave soldier of the cross, the first knight of the Canadian wildwoods, passed from the sphere of earthly life, a life without stain, whether among the intriguing courtiers of Paris or in the midst of naked license in the Indian camp. End of section 6. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 7 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Laud, from 1635 to 1666. When Port Royal fell before Argyle, it will be remembered, young Biencourt took to the woods with his French bush lopers and Indian followers of Nova Scotia. The farms and fort of Annapolis Basin, granted to his father by special patents, lay in ruins. Familiar with the woods as the English buccaneer who had destroyed the fort was with the ship's cabin, Biencourt withdrew to the southwest corner of Nova Scotia, where he built a rude stronghold of logs and slabs near the modern Cape Sable. Here he could keep in touch with the French fishermen off Cape Breton, and also traffic with the Indians of the mainland. With Biencourt was a young man of his own age, boon comrade, kindred spirit, who had come to Port Royal, a boy of fourteen, in 1606, in the gay days of Mark Lake Scorbeau, Charles de la Tour. Sea rovers, bush lopers, these two could bid defiance to English raiders. Whether Biencourt died in 1623 or went home to France is unknown, but he deeded over to his friend Charles de la Tour all possessions in Arcadia. And now England again comes on the scene. By virtue of Cabot's discovery and Argyle's conquest, 
the king of england in sixteen twenty one grants to sir william alexander the earl of stirling all of arcadia renamed nova scotia new scotland by way of encouraging immigration the order of nova scotia baronets is created a title being granted to those who subscribe to the colonization company sir william alexander's colonists shun the french bushlopers under charles de la tour down to fort st louis on cape sable the seventy scotch colonists go on up the annapolis basin and build their fort four miles from the old port royal how did they pass the pioneer years these scottish retainers of the nova scotia baronets report among the french fishing fleet says thirty died of scurvy but of definite information not a vestige remains the annals of these colonists are as completely lost to history as the annals of the lost roanoke colony in virginia under the same english patent lord old tree lands english colonists in cape breton the grand summer rendezvous of the french fishermen but two can play at argyle's game of raids french seamen swoop down on old tree's colony capture fifty destroy the settlement and run up the white flag of france in place of the red standard of england charles latour with his huguenots hides safely ensconced behind his slab palisade the swarthy faces of half a hundred indian retainers lighted up by the huge logs of blades on the hearth charles de latour takes counsel with himself english at port royal english at cape breton english on the mainland at boston english ships passing and repassing his lone lodge in the wilderness he will be safer with charles de la tour with wider distance between himself and the foe and he will take more poultries where there are fewer traders still keeping his fort in nova scotia la tour goes across fundy bay and builds him a second stronger fort on st john river new brunswick near where carlton town stands today then two things happen that upset all plans the hundred associates are given all canada quebec and acadia founded by cardinal richelieu the hundred associates are violently catholic violently anti-protestant Charles de la Tour need expect no favors, if indeed the grant that he holds from Biencourt be not assailed. Double reason for moving the most of his possessions across Fundy Bay to St. John River. Then the Englishmen under the Kirk brothers capture Quebec. As luck or ill luck will have it among the French captured from the French ships of the hundred associates down at Tadoussac is Claude de la Tour, the father of Charles. Claude de la Tour was a Protestant. This and his courtly manner and his noble birth commended him to the English court. What had France done for Claude de la Tour? Placed him under the ban on account of his religion. Claude de la Tour promptly became a British subject received the title baronet of nova scotia with enormous grants of land on st john river new brunswick married an english lady in waiting to the queen and sailed three men of war for nova scotia to win over his son charles no writer like mark les Cabot was present to describe the meeting between father and son but one can guess the stormy scene the war between love of country and love of father the guns of the son's fort pointing at the father's vessels. The father's arguments were strong. What had France done for the Tours? By siding with England, they would receive safe asylum in case of persecution and enormous grants of land on St. John River. But the son's arguments were stronger. The father must know from his English bride, made in waiting to the English queen, that England had no intention 
of keeping her newly captured possessions in Canada, but had already decided to trade them back to France for a dowry to the English queen. If Canada were given back to France, what were English grants in New Brunswick worth? If those who sent you think me capable of betraying my country, even at the prayer of my father, they are mightily mistaken, thundered the young man, ordering his gunners to their places. I don't purchase honors by crime. I don't undervalue the offer of England's king, but the king of France is just as able to reward me. The king of France has confided the defense of Acadia to me, and I'll defend it to my last breath. Stung by his son's rebuke, the elder Latour retired to his ship, wrote one more unveiling appeal, then landed his mariners to rush the fort. But the rough bush lopers inside the palisades were expert marksmen. Their raking cross fire kept the English at a distance, and the father could neither drive nor coax his men to the sticking point of courage to scale palisades in such an unnatural war. Charles de Latour was now in an unenviable plight. He dared not go back to France a traitor. He could not go back to England, having failed to win the day. The son built him a dwelling outside the fort, and there this famous courtier of two great nations with his noble wife retired to pass the end of his days in a wildwood wilderness far enough from the gaudy tinsel of courts. The fate of both husband and wife is unknown. Charles de Latour's predictions were soon verified. The Treaty of St. Germain de Laye in 1632 gave back all Canada to France, and the young man's loyalty was rewarded by the French king confirming the father's English patent to the lands of St. John River, New Brunswick. Perhaps he expected more. He certainly wanted to be governor of Arcadia and may have looked for fresh title to Port Royal, which Biancourt had deeded to him. His ambition was embittered. Cardinal Richelieu of the Hundred Associates had his own favorites to look after. Arcadia is divided into three provinces. Over all, as governor, is Isaac Razili, chief of the Hundred Associates. Latour holds St. John. One, St. Denis, is given Cape Breton and Port Royal. The best province of all falls to Sieur d'Aulnay de Charzay, friend and relative of Richelieu. And when Razili dies in 1635, Charzenay, with his strong influence at court, easily secures the dead man's patents with all land grants attached. Charzenay becomes governor of Arcadia. For a second time, Latour is thwarted. Who began the border warfare matters little. Whether Charzenay, as lord of all Arcadia, first ordered Latour to surrender St. John, or Latour, holding his grant from Biancourt, to Port Royal, ordered Charsenay to give up Annapolis Basin, war had begun. Such border warfare as it is parallel only in the raids of rival barons in the Middle Ages. Did Latour's vessels, laden with furs, slip out from St. John River across Fundy Bay, bound for France? There lay at Cape Sable and Sable Island Charsenay's freebooters. Charchenay's wreckers, ready to board the ship or lure her a wreck on Sable Island reefs by false lights. It is unsafe to accept as facts charges and counter charges made by these two enemies, but from independent sources it seems fairly certain that Charchenay, unknown to Cardinal Richelieu, was a bit of a freebooter and wrecker for his men made a regular business of waylaying English ships from Boston. Dutch ships from New York as they passed Sable Island and Charcenay's name became cordially hated by the Protestant colonies of New England. Latour, being Huguenot, could count on firm friends in Boston. Countless legends cling to Fundy Bay 
of the forays between these two. In 1640, Latour and his wife, cruising past Annapolis Basin in their fur ships, rashly entered and attacked Port Royal. Their ship was run aground by Chaucenay's vessels and captured, but the friars persuaded the victor to set Latour and his wife free, pending an appeal to France. France, of course, decided in favor of Chaucenay, who was of raw blood, a relative of Richelieu's, in higher favor with the court. Latour's patent was revoked, and he was ordered to surrender his fort on the St. John. In answer, Latour loaded his cannon, locked the fort gates, and bade defiance to Chaucenay. Chaucenay sails across Bundy Bay in June 1643 with a fleet of four vessels and 500 men to bombard the fort. Latour was without provisions, though his store ship from France lay in hiding outside, blocked from entering by Chaucenay's fleet. Days passed. Resistance was hopeless. On one side lay the impenetrable forest, on the other, Chaucenay's fleet. On the night of June twelfth, Latour and his wife slipped from a little sally port in the dark, ran along the shore, and invading spies succeeded in rowing out to the store ship. Ebb tide carried them far from the four men war, anchored fast in front of the abandoned fort. Then sails out, the store ship fled for Boston, where Latour and his wife appealed for aid. The Puritans of Boston had qualms of conscience about interfering in this French quarrel, but they did not forget that Charsenay's records had stripped their merchant ships come to grief on the reefs of Sable Island. Latour gave the Boston merchants a mortgage on his, his belongings at St. John and in return obtained four vessels, 50 mariners, 92 soldiers, and 38 cannon. With this fleet, he swooped down on Fundy Bay in July. Charsenay's vessels lay before Fort St. John, where the stubborn little garrison still held out when Latour came down on him like an enraged eagle. Charsenay's fur ships were boarded, scuttled, and sunk, while the commander himself fled in terror for Port Royal, all sails pressed, Latour pursued right into Annapolis Basin, wounding seven of the enemy, killing three, taking one prisoner. Charsenay's one remaining vessel grounded in the river. A fight took place near the site of the mill which Poincourt had built long ago, but Charsenay succeeded in gaining the shelter of Port Royal, where his cannon soon compelled Latour to fly from Annapolis Basin. Charsenay found it safer to pass that winter in France, and Latour gathered in all the pelty traffic of the bay. Early in 1644, Charsenay returned and sent a friar to secure the neutrality of the New Englanders. All summer negotiations dragged on between Boston and Port Royal, Latour, meanwhile, scouring land and sea unchecked, packing his fork with peltries. Finally, Charsenay promised to desist from all fur trade along the coast if the New England colonies would remain neutral. And the colonies promised not to aid Latour. Latour was now outlawed by the French government, and Charsenay had actually induced New England to promise not to convey either Latour or his wife to or from Bay of Fundy in English boats. Latour chanced to be absent from his fort in 1645. Like a bird of prey, Charsenay swooped down on St. John River, but he had not reckoned on Madame Latour, Frances Marie Jacqueline. With the courage and agility of a trained soldier, she commanded her little garrison of fifty and returned the raiders cannonade with a fury that sent Charsenay limping back to Port Royal with splintered decks, twenty mangled corpses jumbled aft, and a dozen men wounded to the death lying in the hold. With all the power of France at his back, Charsenay had 
been defeated by a woman, the Huguenot wife of an outlaw. He must reduce Latour or stand discredited before the world. Furious beyond words, he hastened to France to prepare an overwhelming armament. But Madame Latour was not idle. She, too, hastened across the Atlantic to solicit aid in London. One can imagine how Charcenay gnashed his teeth. Here, at last, was his chance. The Boston vessels were not to convey the Latours back to Acadia. Like a hawk, Charcenay cruised the sea for the outcoming ship with its fair passenger. But Madame Latour had made a cast-iron agreement with the master of the sailing vessel to bring her direct to Boston. Instead of this, the vessel cruised the St. Lawrence, trading with the Indians, and so delayed the aid coming to Latour. But when Charcenay's searchers came on board off Sable Island, Madame Latour was hidden among the freight in the hold. For the delay, she sued the sailing master in Boston and obtained a judgment of 2,000 pounds. And when he failed to pay, had his cargo seized and sold, and with the proceeds equipped three vessels to aid her outlawed husband. So the whole of 1646 passed each side girding itself for the final fray. April 1647, spies brought word to Charcenay that Latour was absent from his fort. Waiting not a moment, Charcenay hurried ships, soldiers, cannon across the bay. Inside Latour's fort was no confusion. Madame Latour had ordered every man to his place. Day and night for three days the siege lasted. Charcenay's men closing in on the palisades so near they could bandy words with the fighters on the galleries inside the walls. Among the tourist fighters were Swiss mercenaries, men who fight for the highest pay. Did Charcenay, in the language of the day, grease the fist of the Swiss sentry? Or was it a case of boorish fellow refusing to fight under a woman's command? Legend gives both explanations, but on Easter Sunday morning, Charcenay's men gained entrance by scaling the walls where the Swiss sentry stood. Madame Latour rushed her men to an inner fort loopholed with guns. Afraid of a final defeat that would disgrace him before all the world, Charcenay called upon generous terms if she would surrender. To save the lives of the men, Madame Latour agreed to honorable surrender, and the doors were opened. In rushed Charcenay. To his amazement, the woman had only a handful of men. Disgusted with himself and boiling over with revenge for all those years of enmity, Charcenay forgot his promise and hanged every soul of the garrison but the traitor who acted as executioner, compelling Madame Latour to watch the execution with a halter round her neck amid the jeers of the soldiery. Legend says that the experience drove her insane and caused her death within three weeks. Charcenay was now lord of all Arcadia with 10,000 pounds worth of Madame Latour's jewelry transferred to Port Royal and all Latour's furs safe in the warehouses of Annapolis Basin. But he did not long enjoy his triumph. He had the reputation of treating his Indian servants with great brutality. On the 24th of May, 1650, an Indian was rowing him up the narrows near Port Royal Charcenay could not swim. Without apparent cause, the boat upset. The Indians swam ashore. The commander perished. Legend again avars that the Indian upset the boat to be revenged on Charcenay for some brutality. Latour had been wandering from Newfoundland to Boston and Quebec, seeking aid, but a lost cause had few friends and if Latour turned private on Boston boats, he probably thought he was justified in paying off the score of Boston's bargain with Charcenay. Later, he turned trader with the Indians from Hudson Bay and found friends in Quebec. 
word of his wrongs reached the French court. When Charlesney perished, Latour was at last appointed lieutenant governor of Acadia. Widow Charcenay, left with eight children, all miners, made what repartition she could to Latour by giving back the fort on the St. John, and Latour, to wipe out the bitter enmity, married the widow of his enemy in February of 1653. But this was not the seal of peace on his troubled life. Cromwell was now ascendant in England, and Major Sedgwick of Boston in 1654, with a powerful fleet, captured Port Royal and St. John. Weary of fighting what seemed to be destiny, Latour became a British subject, and with two other Englishmen was granted the whole of Arcadia. Ten years later, his English partners bought out his rights, and Latour died in the land of his many trials about 1666. A year later, the Treaty of Breda restored Acadia to France. End of section 7. Recording by Linda Bree Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 8 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North, by Agnes C. Lott, from 1635 to 1650, Part 1. While Charles Latour and Charnassay scoured the Bay of Fundy in border warfare like buccaneers of the Spanish main, what was Quebec doing? The hundred associates were to colonize the country, but fur trading and farming never go together. One means the end of the other, and the hundred associates shifted the obligation of settling the country by granting vast estates called signatories along the St. Lawrence and leave to these new lords of the soil the duty of bringing out habitants. Later, they deeded over for an annual rental of beaver skins, the entire fur monopoly to the habitant company made up of the leading people of New France. So ended all the fine promises of 4,000 colonists. Years ago, Pontgrave had learned that the Indians of the upcountry did not care to come down the St. Lawrence farther than Lake St. Peter's, where Iroquois foe lay in ambush and the year before Champlain died, a double expedition had set out from Quebec in July, one to build a fort north of Lake St. Peter's at the entrance to the river with three mouths, in other words, to found three rivers, the other under Father Bebeuf, the Jesuit, and Jean Nicolet, the woodrunner, to establish a mission in the country of the Hurons and to explore the Great Lakes. In fact, it must never be forgotten that Champlain's ambitions in laying the foundations of a new nation aimed just as much to establish a kingdom of heaven on earth as to win a new kingdom for France. Always in the minds of the fathers of New France, church was to be the first, state the second. When Charles de Montmagny, Knight of Malta, landed in Quebec one June morning in 1636 to succeed Champlain as governor of New France. He noticed a crucifix planted by the path side where viceroy and officers clambered up the steep hill to Castle St. Louis. Instantly, Montmagny fell to his knees before the cross in silent adoration, and his example was followed by all the gay train of beplumbed officers. The Jesuits regarded the episode as a splendid omen for New France and set their chapel organ rolling a te deum of praise, while governor and retinue filed before the altars with bared heads. It was in the same spirit that Montreal was founded. The Jesuits' letters on the Canadian mission were now being read in France. Religious orders 
were on fire with with missionary order the canadian missions became the fashion of the court ladies of noble blood asked no greater privilege than to contribute their fortunes for missions in canada nuns lay prostrate before the altars praying night and day for the advancement of the heavenly kingdom on the st lawrence the jesuits had begun their college in quebec the very year that champlain had first come to the st lawrence there had been born in normandy of noble patronage a little girl who became a passionate devotee of canadian missions to divert her mind from the calling of a nun her father had thrown her into a world of gaiety from which she emerged married but her husband died in a few years and madame de la peltrie left a widow at twenty-two turned again her heart and soul to the scheme of endowing a canadian mission again her father tried to divert her mind threatening to cut off her fortune if she did not marry an engagement to a young noble who was as keen a devotee as herself quieted her father and averted the loss of her fortune on the death of her father the formal union was dissolved and madame de la petrie proceeded to the ursuline convent of tours where the jesuits had already chosen a mother superior for the new institution to be founded at quebec marie of the incarnation a woman of some fifty years a widow like madame de la petrie and like madame de la petrie a mystic dreamer of celestial visions and of divine communings and heroic sacrifices how much of truth how much of self-delusion lay in these dreams of heavenly revelation is not for the outsider to say it is as impossible for the practical mind to pronounce judgment on the mystic as for the mystic to pronounce sentence on the scientist both have their truths both have their errors and by their fruits are they known may fourth sixteen thirty nine madame de la petrie and marie of the incarnation embarked from dieppe for canada in the ship were also another ursuline nun three hospital sisters to found the hotel dieu at quebec father vimont superior of Quebec Jesuits, and two other priests. The boat was like a chapel. Ship's bell tolled services. Morning prayer and evening song were chanted from the decks, and the pilgrims firmly believed that their vows allayed a storm. July 1st, they were among the rocking dories of the Newfoundland fishermen, and then on the 15th, the little sailboat washed and rolled to ink her inshore among the fur traders under the heights of Tadoussac. At sight of the somber Saguenay, the silver-flooded St. Lawrence, the frowning mountains, the far purple hills, the primeval forests through which the wind rushed with the sound of the sea, the fishing craft dancing on the tide like cockle boats, the grizzled fur traders bronzed at the crinkled oak forest where they passed their lives, the tawny, naked savages agape at these white-skinned women come from afar, the hearts of the housed-up nuns swelled with emotions strange and sweet, the emotions of a new life in a new world. And when they scrambled over the rope coils above the fishing schooner to go on up to Quebec, and heard the deep-voiced shoutings of the men and witnessed the toilers of the deep fighting wind and wave for the harvest at of the sea it did dawn on the fair sisterhood that god must have workers out in the strife of the world as well as workers shut up from the world inside covenant walls who knows who knows at tadasuk that morning to both Madame de la Petrie and Marie of the Incarnation, it must have seemed as if their visions had become real. And then the cannon of Quebec began to thunder till the echoes rolled from hill to hill and shook, as the mystics thought, the very strongholds of hell. 
Tears stream down their cheeks at such welcome. The whole Quebec populace had rallied to the water front, and there stood Governor Montmagny in velvet cloak with a sword at belt waving hat in welcome. Soldiers and priests cheered till the ramparts rang, and the nuns put foot to earth once more. They fell on their knees and kissed the soil of Canada. August 1st was fete day in Quebec. The chapel chimes rang, and rang again their gladness. The organ rolled out its floods of soul-shattering music, and deep-throated chant of priests invoked God's blessing on the coming of the women to the mission. So began the Ursuline Covenant of Quebec and the Hotel Dieu of the Hospital Sisters. But Montreal was still a howling wilderness, untenanted by man save in midsummer when the fur traders came to champlain's factory and the canoes of the indians from the up country danced down the swirling rapids like seabirds on waves the letters from the jesuit missions touched more hearts than those of the mystic nuns in anjou dwelt a receiver of taxes jerome de royer de la Daversière a stout, practical, God-fearing man with a family, about as far removed in temperament from the founders of the Ursulines as a character could well be. Yet he, too, had mystic dreams and heard voices bidding him found a mission in the tentless wilderness of Montreal. To the practical man, the thing seems sheer moon-stark madness, if de Versier had lived in modern days, he would have, have been committed to an asylum. He was a man with a family without a fortune, commanded by what he thought was the voice of heaven to found a hospital in a wilderness where there were no people. Also in Paris dwelt a young priest named Jean-Jacques Ollier, who heard the self-same voices uttering the self-same command. These two men were unknown to each other, yet when they met, by chance, in the picture gallery of an old castle, there fell from their eyes, as it were, scales, and they beheld as a vision each of the other's soul, and recognized in each fellow helper and comrade of the spirit. To all this the practical man cries out, Bosch, yet Montreal is no Bosch but a stately city, and it sprang from the dreams, full dreams, enemies would call them, of these two men, the Sulpician priest and the Anjou tax collector. Hour after hour, arm in arm, they walked and talked, the man of prayers and the man of taxes. People or no people at Montreal, money or no money, they decided that the inner voice must be obeyed. A Montreal society was formed, six friends joined what would be equal to seventy five thousand dollars was collected there were to be no profits on this capital it was all to be invested to the glory of the kingdom of heaven unselfish if you like foolish they may have been but not hypocrites first of all they must become seigneurs of montreal but the island of montreal had already been granted by the hundred associates to one Lazon, to render the title doubtly secure, the Vassier and Ollier obtained deeds to the island from La Sonde and from the Hundred Associates. Forty-five colonists, part soldiers, part devotees, were then gained as volunteers, but a verifiable soldier of heaven was desired as commander. Paul de Chamette, Sieur de Massonneuve, was noted for his heroism in war and zeal in religion. When other officers returned from battle for wild revels, Maisonneuve withdrew to play the flute or pass hours in religious contemplation. His name occurred to both Davassier and Ollier as fittest for command, but to make doubly sure they took lodgings near him, studied his disposition, and then casually told him of their plans and asked for his cooperation. Maisonneuve was in the prime of life, 
on the way to high service in the army his zeal took fire at thought of founding a kingdom of god at montreal but his father furiously opposed of what may have seemed a mad scheme Masonive's answer was the famous promise of christ no man hath left house or brethren or sister for my sake but he shall receive a hundredfold Masonive was warned there would be no earthly award no pay for his arduous task but he answered i devote my life and future and i expect no recompense mademoiselle jean mance thirty-four years old who had given herself to good works from childhood thought she had not yet joined the cloistier now felt the call to labor in the wilderness later in sixteen fifty three came marguerite borgois to the little colony beneath the mountain she too like jean mance distrusted dreams and visions and mystic communings cherishing a religion of good works rather than introspection of the soul Van Versier and Ollier remained in France. Fortunately for Montreal, practical Christians, fighting soldiers of the cross, carried the heavenly standard to the wilderness. It was too late to ascend the St. Lawrence when the ship brought the crusaders to Quebec in August 1641, and difficulties harried them from the outset. Was Montmagny, the governor, jealous of Maisonneuve? or did he simply realize the fearful dangers of Masonet's people would run going beyond the protection of Quebec? At all events, he disapproved this building of a second colony at Montreal, when the first colony at Quebec could barely gain substance. He offered them the island of Orleans in exchange for the island of Montreal and warned them of Iroquois raid. I have not come to argue, answered Messineuf, but to act. It is my duty to found a colony at Montreal, and thither I go, though every tree be an Iroquois. Messineuf passed the winter building boats to ascend the St. Lawrence next spring, and Madame de la Petrie, having established the Ursulines at Quebec, now cast into her lot with the Montrealers for two years. May 8, 1642, the little flotilla set out from Quebec, a pinnace with passengers, a barge with provisions, two long boats propelled oars, and a sweep. Montamy and Father Vinmont accompanied the crusaders, and as the boats came within sight of the wooded mountain on May 17th, hymns of praise rose from the pilgrims that must have mingled strangely on indian ears with the roar of the angry rapids one can easily call up the scene the mountain the misty with the gathering shadows of sunset misty as a veiled bride with the color and bloom of spring the boats moored for the night below st helen's island where the sun blazing behind the half foliage trees paints a path of fire on the river the white bark wigwams along the shore with the red gleam of campfire here and there through the forest the wilderness world bathed in a peace of heaven as the vesper hymn floats over the evening air it is a scene that will never again be enacted in the history of the world dreamers dreaming greatly building a castle of dreams a fortress of holiness in the very center of wilderness barbarity and cruelty unspeakable the multitudinous voices of traffic shriek where the crusaders hymn rose that may night a great city has risen on the foundations which these dreamers land let us not scoff too loudly at their mystic visions and religious rhapsodies another generation may scoff at our too much worldliness with our dreamless grind and visionless toil and harder creeds that reject everything which cannot be computed in terms of traffic's dollar well for us if the fruit of our creeds remain to attest as much worth as the deeds of these crusaders 
Early next morning, the boats pulled ashore where Cartier had landed 100 years before and Champlain had built his factory 30 years ago. Maisonneuve was first to spring on land. He dropped to his knees in prayer. The others, as they landed, did likewise. Their hymns floated out over the forest. Madame de la Petrie, Jean Mance, and the servant, Charlotte Barr, quickly decorated a wildwood altar with evergreens. Then, with Montmay the governor, Maisonneuve the soldier, standing on either side, Madame de la Petrie and Jean Mance and Charlotte Barr bowed in reverence. With soldiers and sailors standing at rest, unhooded, Father Vimont held the first religious services at Mont Royal. You are a grain of mustard seed, he said, and you shall grow till your branches overshadow the earth. Masonev cut the first tree for the fort, and a hundred legends might be told of the little colony's pioneer trials. Once a flood threatened the existence of the fort, a cross was erected to stay the waters, and a vow was made. If heaven would save the fort, a cross should be carried and placed on the summit of the mountain. The river abated, and Masonev climbed the steep mountain, staggering under the weight of an enormous cross, and planted it at the highest point. Here, in the presence of all, mass was held, and it became a regular pilgrimage from the fort up the mountain to the cross. End of section 8. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 9 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North, by Agnes C. Lott, from 1635 to 1650, Part 2. In 1743 came Louis de Alembust and his wife, both zealously bound by the same vows as devotees, bringing word of more funds for Villa Marie, as Montreal was called. Montmagny's warning of Iroquois proved all too true. Within a year, in June 1743, six workmen were beset in the fields, only one escaping. Because his mission was to convert the Indians, Maisonneuve had been ever reluctant to meet the Iroquois in open war, preferring to retreat within the fort when the dog pilot and her litter barked loud warning that Indians were hiding in the woods. Anyone who knows the Indian character will realize how clemency would be mistaken for cowardice. Even Maisonneuve's soldiers began to doubt him. My lord, my lord, they urged, are the enemy never to get a sight of you? Are we never to face the foe? Maisonneuve's answer was in March 1644, when ambushed hostiles were detected stealing on the fort. Follow me, he ordered thirty men, leaving de Alembust in command of the fort. Near the place, now known as Place de Alms, the little band was greeted by the elder scream of eighty painted Iroquois. Shots fell thick and fast. The Iroquois dashed to rescue their wounded, and a young chief recognizing Maisonneuve as the leader of the white men made a rush for the honor of capturing the French commander alive. Maisonneuve had put himself between his retreating men and the advancing warriors. Firing, he would retreat a pace, then fire again, keeping his face to the foe. His men succeeded in rushing up the hillock and then made for the gates in a wild stampede. Maisonneuve was backing away, a pistol in each hand. The Iroquois circled him from tree to tree, nearer and nearer, and like a wildwood creature of prey, was watching his chance to spring. When the Frenchman fired, the pistol missed. Dodging, the Indian leaped. Maisonneuve discharged the other pistol. The Iroquois fell dead. 
and while warriors rescued the body, Maisonneuve gained the fort gates. This was only one of countless frays when the dog pilot with her puppies sounded the alarm of prowlers in the woods. What were the letters, what the adventures described by the Jesuits that aroused such zeal and inspired such heroism? It would require many volumes to record the adventures of the Jesuits in Canada and a long list to include all their heroes martyred for the faith. Only a few of the most prominent episodes of the Jesuits' adventures can be given here. When Pierre Lejeune reached Quebec after the victory of the Kirk brothers, he found only the charred remains of a mission on the old site of Cartier's winter quarters, down on the St. Charles. Of houses, only the gray stone cottage of Madame Hubert had been left standing. Here Lejeune was welcomed and housed till the little mission could be rebuilt. At first, it consisted of only mud-plastered log cabins, thatch-roofed, divided into four rooms, with garret and cellar. One room decorated with saints' images and pictures served as chapel. Another as kitchen, a third as lodgings, the fourth as refractory. In this humble abode, six Jesuit priests and two lay brothers passed the winter after the war. The roof leaked like a sieve. The snow piled high almost as the top of the door. Lejeune's first care was to obtain pupils. These consisted of an Indian boy and a Negro lad left by the English. Deals of porridge given free attracted more Indian pupils, but Lejeune's greatest difficulty was to learn the Indian language. Hearing that a renegade Indian named Pierre, who had served the French as interpreter, lodged with some Algonquins camped below Cape Diamond, Lejeune tramped up the river bank along what is now the lower road where he found the Indians wigwamming, and by the bribe of free food obtained Pierre. Pierre was at best a tricky scoundrel who considered it a joke to give Lejeune the wrong word for some religious precept gorging himself on the missionaries' food, stole their communion wine, and ran off at Lent to escape fasting. When Champlain returned to receive Quebec back from the English, more priests joined the Jesuits' mission. Among them was the lion-hearted giant, Brebeuf. If Champlain's bushlopers could join bands of wandering Indians for the extension of French dominion, surely the Jesuits could dare as perilous a life for the greater glory of God as their vows declared. Lejeune joined a band of wandering Montagnais. Pierre, the rascal, tapping the keg of sacramental wine the first night out and turning the whole camp into a drunken bedlam till his own brother sobered him with a kettle of hot water flung full in the face. That night the priests slept apart from the camp in the woods. By the time the hunters reached the forest borderland between Quebec and New Brunswick, their number had increased to forty-five. By Christmas time game is usually dormant, still living on the shores of the fall and not yet driven afield by string hunger. In camp there was no food. The hunters halted the march and came in Christmas Eve of 1633 with not so much as a pound of flesh for nearly 50 people. From the first the Indian medicine man had heaped ridicule on the white priest, and Pierre had refused to interpret as much as a single prayer, but now the whole camp was starving. Pierre happened to tell the other Indians that Christmas was the day on which the white man's God had come to earth. In vain the medicine man had pounded his tom-tom and shouted at the Indian gods from the top of wigwams and offered sacrifice of animals to be slain. No game had come as the result of the medicine man's invocation. Lejeune gathered the people about him and through Pierre, the interpreter, bade them to try the white man's god. In the largest of the wigwams, a little altar was fitted up. 
then the indians repeated this prayer after lejeune jesus son of the almighty who died for us who promised that if we ask anything in thy name thou wilt do it i pray thee with all my heart give food to these people these people promises thee faithfully will trust thee entirely and obey thee with all their heart my lord hear my prayer i present thee my life for these people most willingly to die that they may live and know thee take that back grunted the chief we love you we don't want you to die i only want to show that i am your friend answered the priest lejeune then commanded them to go forth to the hunt full of faith that god would give them food but alas for the poor father's hopes and the childlike indian vow true they found abundance of food a beaver down full of beaver a moose a porcupine taken by the indian medicine man father lejeune with radiant face met the hunters returning laden with game we must thank you god for this said the indian chief throwing down his load bah says pierre you'd have found it anyway this is not the time to talk sneered the medicine man let the hungry people eat and by the time the indians had gorged themselves with ample measure for their long fast they were torpid with sleep the sad priest was fain to wander out under the stars there in the snow-padded silences of the white lined forest far from the joyous peal of christmas bells he knelt alone and worshipped god for five months he wandered with the montagnais the hunters turned toward quebec with their furs at three in the morning lejeune knocked on the door of the mission house at quebec and was welcomed home by the priests the pilgrimage had taught him what the jesuits had always held the way to power with a people is through the education of the children give me a child for the first seven years of its life said a famous educator and i care not what you do with him the rest of his years missions and schools must be established among the tribes of hurons and iroquois consequently when champlain sent his soldiers in sixteen thirty four to build a fort at three rivers they were accompanied by three jesuits chief of whom was jean de brebeuf lion-hearted bound for the land of the hurons the chapel bells of quebec rang and rang again in honor of the new jesuit mission morning noon and night they chimed in airy music calling men's thoughts to god just as you may hear the chimes today and the ramparts below quebec thundered and re-echoed with salvos of cannon when the missionaries set out for three rivers at three rivers waited the indians of the up country the jesuits embarked with them for the land of the hurons the priests traveled barefoot to avoid injuring the frail bark of the canoes Barely had farewell cheers faded on the river when the canoes spread apart. With pieces of buckskin hoisting on fishing rods for sail and flipping of paddles as naked bronzed arms set the pace, the voyage had begun. Heroism is easy with chapel bells ringing. It is another matter, barefoot with sleeves rolled up. It was the same trail that Champlain had followed up the Ottawa only champlain was assured of good treatment for he had promised to fight in the indian wars but the jesuits were dependent on the caprice of their conductors any one who from experience in the wilds has learned how the term tenderfoot came to be applied will realize the hardships endured and endured without self-pity by those scholarly men of immured life the rocks of the portage cut their naked feet the indians refused to carry their packs overland and flung bundles of clothing and food into the water in fair weather the voyagers slept on the sand under the overturned canoes in rain a wigwam was raised and into the close confines of this tent crowded men women and children 
for the most part naked and with less idea of decency than a domestic dog each night as the boats were beached the priests wandered off into the woods to hold their prayers in privacy soon the canoes were far apart the different boats did not camp together and the white men were scattered alone among the savages robberies increased till when Brebeuf reached georgian bay thirty days from leaving three rivers he had little left but the bundles he had carried for himself Brebeuf had been to huron country before with etienne brule champlain's pathfinder but the first mission would no record exists brebeuf found that brule had been murdered near the modern petang and the indians had scarcely brought priest's canoe ashore when they bolted through the woods leaving him to follow as best he could take a map of modern ontario draw a circle round rogan bay running from muskoda through the through lake simcoe and up the manitoulin island here on the very stamping ground of the summer tourist was a scene of the jesuits huron mission when brebeuf's tall frame emerged from the woods the whole village of ehonteria dashed out to welcome him shouting he has come he has come again behold the black robe has come again young braves willingly ran back through the forest for the baggage which the voyageurs had thrown aside and at one o'clock in the morning as the messengers came through the moonlight forest brebeuf took up his abode in the house of the leading chief later came fathers de vost and daniel by october the indians had built the missionaries their wigwam a bark-covered house of logs thirty-six feet long divided into three rooms reception room living quarters church in the entrance hall assembled the indians squatting on the floor gazing in astonishment at the religious pictures on the wall and above all at the clock what does he say they would ask listening solemnly to the ticking he says hang on the kettle brebeuf would answer as the clock struck twelve and the whole conclave would be given a simple meal of corn porridge but at four the clock sang a different song it says get up and go home brebeuf would explain and the indians would fall out knowing well that the black robes were to engage in prayer no holiday in the wild woods was the jesuit mission chapel bell called to service at four in the morning eight was the breakfast hour the morning was passed teaching preaching visiting at two o'clock was dinner when a chapter of the bible was read at four the indians were dismissed and the missionaries met to compare notes and plan the next day's campaign end of section nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc